Uh, we'll move on to some other issues because Andrew Dillon was on the AFL platform Gettable with Riley Beveridge and Cow to me during the week, Jono, and the prospect of trading contracted players is clearly on the agenda of the AFL. I wanted to get your thoughts after we hear from the new AFL CEO. What, when we've been in discussions with um, the clubs, it's like about trying to just, can you um, balance up the uh, the way that, um, you know, the economics or, you know, the way the trades work? And we look at it as more less trade without consent, sort of like, like a way that the clubs can lead trades. Now, it's one that um, the PA historically have pushed back on. And what we're looking to do is just, can we add another alternative for clubs and for players to move around? And if it was going to happen, I think there'd be really tight parameters around it, um, as in the players would have to have a long period of time on their contract. They'd have to be over a certain amount um, getting paid. So all those sorts of things, we'll have the discussions with the Players Association about it. But it is something that's been on the club's horizon for a while. It's coming, Jono. We'll the get ready for it. For a club to be able to say, all right, such and such has got three years left on his contract, but right now he doesn't really fit into what we are doing. We want to trade him without his consent, provided there is a club willing to pick up the contract. And yes, there's some parameters that Andrew explained there, what they're paid, how long they've been on the list, all of that will come into it. But mm. on the surface of it, do you like it? And is it good for the game? Uh, it's just something that, once again, we're going to have to get used to happening. It's a, it's a change in the game that will will come in. It's just understanding it, and and we'll mm. I'll have to learn. Like I'm I'm mm. not really over how it works in the US, and I assume this is a US based model. Kane, you might know a little bit more about that space in terms of how it actually works over in the US. But it seems like we're flowing down that line as well of not just having a a, a, a basic sort of trade period mid season. It could be quite mm. extensive with some opportunities, not only for the well. It, it, not only for the players that are not getting a game that you think might bolster, but the stars of some stars. of the stars or yeah. or heavily contracted players that were in really good form, got a five year deal, haven't played that well for a couple, or been on the edge, you know, playing some good games, some average games that a club goes, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna release you and and send you yep. off to the the Fremantle Dockers if they're a, you know if it's a Collingwood Footy Club just as a, a prime example. So and the player will have no say in that, mm. Um, mm. which is which is big in itself because we know within our footy communities that family and moving family and just uplifting it's it's diff very difficult to do you spoke of it you, yourself yeah, so it's disruptive yeah no doubt it is but so it's it's gonna it it's going to play out but i think we all just need to start especially myself who's not really educated in this space start doing more on it now because and as mm. fans we're going to have to really understand how it's all going to come together because it's going to come yeah, uh, I mean, it's incredibly complicated in American sport and would have a lot of our audience that would be passionate about that. There's different sort of clauses in player contracts. Some players have a no trade clause still where, you, where mm. they still have to approve it. Some don't. Like you could be. So that will come on, in then, of course. That yeah. has to be a part of well, the contract you, you setup. Would, you would think so. But you could you could have a player who is on four different teams in four different seasons. Like that's what happens over there. Now, <laughs> is that good for the game? I don't know. But the best example yeah. that I can think of of a current player that may work for for both is is Harry Mackay. Like if Carlton mm. are tight with their salary cap, if they think, well, we want to keep to Coning, we can manage it with the Coning and Kurno. We've given Pitnet four years, so they're the key position pillars that we've got. Yes, we signed Harry to a seven year deal or whatever it was, um, but there's the Sydney Swans that are willing to pick up the contract, give us the right compensation for mm. it. It frees up some room in our salary cap. It gets us back into the early stages of the draft to go and add some talent to a list that hasn't got them where they thought it would go, then it works. And, you know, I get frustrated with players who are contracted and, and use Juan Francis or use anyone that demands a trade when they're still contracted. And the clubs are still forced to essentially trade them. Not mm. often does a club say, nah, you're contracted, you're staying. If the, if the player makes enough noise, even though they're contracted and their managers do that, they usually get to where they want to go, yet clubs can't do the same in reverse. So I just think it evens it up for So for will this be purely and, on the clubs only in this trade period? The players will not be able to get involved during the season? I know they can in the off-season through the examples you just mentioned and they make the noise mm. and, and, the, and the trade gets done. But will the players have the ability in this particular period, if they see their sights on a flag somewhere, you know, go... Yeah. LeBron James has floated around a fair bit in the US playing for many different teams. He's the best player since Michael Jordan so mm. or Kobe Bryant. So, you know, it, it happens with the very best in the US. So will that is that something that will yeah, happen well, here? 
well, Kevin Durant joined Phoenix, like on the eve of finals, really, yep. like a couple of months before finals. So he, he left Brooklyn because things fell apart and Harden and Kyrie Irving had left. And he's gone, okay, well, it's come to an end of the road at, at Brooklyn. It didn't work. I'm going to go and see if I can get another ring with Phoenix and join Chris Paul and Devin Booker. Like a few weeks so before the finals we're, we're leaning so that way. We I are leaning it, that way. I don't know if clubs would be able to do it mid-season though. Trade contracted players mid-season. I think that would be more a discussion at the end of the year. Have your say on it. The Harcourt's open line, one 736 736 I think it's good for the game. I think jono has got some hesitations and rightly so. How would it work? You can have your say. Jono, Jared has been telling me you're grumpy. All week, Jared has said, look out. Jono is coming in. Spend a bit of time with the great man on Wednesday, and he is not happy. <laughs> we, so we build each why, other up. Why aren't you happy? No, no. It it's just what what gets my goat up a little bit is is the sorry aspect of of an umpire making a mistake on game day and coming out and apologising for it because it personally I think it achieves absolutely nothing. I've been in the situation where. I got uh, hit pretty hard in a prelim. No free kick was paid late in the game. We were sort of on a bit mm. of a run back. Who knows mm. if we would have got there or not? Doesn't matter. But in the preseason, and the you've let it go. You've no, let it go. Of the course. umpire. You, you've just, no, you've I let did it let go that and... go. But the umpire came, and we did a preseason game, and the umpire was there that didn't make the call. He came and apologised to me. I went great. It made no made no difference to me yeah. whatsoever because the call's the call, and. The umpires coming out and saying they missed one, you might as well come out and say you missed them all. What they missed in the first quarter could have cost Collingwood a goal in in that game. Mm. So coming out and saying it just it just builds my frustration levels up a little bit because I don't think it is necessary whatsoever. I don't think it talking to an Adelaide fan this morning, it didn't calm his farm in terms no. of um the the outcome of that particular free kick getting but paid. But it's better than them saying nothing. I, well look, my my thought on this is have a regular spot for the umpires to speak and be accountable, and then it's not reactive. Mm. So if you've got, like Razor Ray, I mean, you keep using this example, but he, he's up every fortnight and it's it's in the calendar. We know it's coming. So it's not reactive to a decision that was made on the weekend. Yeah. Jared can ask him whatever he likes. And that may be a free kick to Jordan Dawson if he officiated in that game or if he didn't. So that's going to come up and he'll address it. When they don't have the platform to do that and when the AFL umpire's boss never speaks... And when there is no footy boss and they never speak, you don't get that platform. Whereas if they said, you know, we're going to make our three most senior umpires available once a week and you can ask them whatever you like. And that may be a question to Jordan yep. Dawson, but it's not reactive. Is that a better solution, I, surely, to inform the fans and the players and the media and everyone? Yeah, well, it could be. And it, we, it's something that has to play out, I think, just to see what the outcome of those sort of discussions. You know pretty quickly if it's going to work and be received in the way that it should be received. And um, and that's the most important important aspect of here. Yeah, we can get a bit upset and a bit frustrated with what's what's sort of happening. But at the end of the day, the decision's the decision. It doesn't change. It doesn't affect well, it affects the outcome, but it's not going to change the outcome. So mm. ultimately, you know, we're we're a move on we're a move on game that has to has to move past things fairly quickly because, you know, that's just the reality, the reality of it. Pushing the back is the other one that Jerry just wants you to mention that because we've got to mention that every week because he's winning he's winning the debate. So he's texted me, he said, mention pushing the back, we're winning the debate, which is which is good. But the other one that's just got me got me thinking a little bit about measurement of our 15 metre kicks. Now this this is something that I don't know how we fix this game, but you know the easiest one that's missed week in, week out. A player takes the mark on the point post. He kicks it cross goal, but he kicks it just to the goal square. Yes. So the Point post to goal post is 6.5 metres. He goes right. to the middle of the goal square. That's another 3.25. So he's kicked at 9.75, Kane. This, if I've done my maths correctly there, <laughs> this is play on. Why are we getting marked called in that part of the ground? Yet if you go forward and you kick a short one, the umpire well, calls play, play on. And that's the easiest way to measure a kick because you've actually got posts that give you your distances. So yep, it's, I, I'm with you, Jono. I mean, it's it, it is well that is, that is easy to measure because you've got the measurements there for you. The ones in general play are a bit harder. They are, but the the one in the back line creates pressure because if you Correct. if you call play on there, pressure comes and then we see a bit more action. You know, close closer to goal rather than just the easy kick sideways. Marks paid, next chip, move on. Ball's already seventy five meters out from goal, and we've missed an opportunity as a game mm. to really close it up and put some serious pressure on an opposition team trying to exit, which is what we're All about. Because right. if we see a big tackle or a big moment or a rush behind because of it, that adds to the um, the state of the game. And I think that's just one thing that we're 
We've got to fix up yeah, very quickly. The rush, the rush behind rule has been good for the game. It's been great. It creates panic and chaos and you know different. Is he going to rush it? Can he rush it? Is he inside nine? He should, well, he, he should on? rush it and he doesn't rush it yeah, is what's I happening know. there because the players don't understand they actually can rush it more often than, than they do. Don't know the rules. Hey, uh, Jono, no one is winning off the bye. So this weekend is fascinating as well because we've got a what big game at the MCG here? featuring happened, Port Gary? Adelaide off the bye. But what, 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 what is your best? Do you know why? Why yeah, aren't no, teams my, winning off the bye? My thought is because clubs give their players too much time off. Now they think, okay, we, we've got to this. We've got to give our players rest. We've got to give them time away from the footy club. Got to freshen up. You don't need to do that in the season. Yep, ha- have a day off. But maintain your training schedule and you maintain your roster. I think mm-hmm. they change things up too off, too much, too much time off, and the players switch off. Feels like a holiday. Some players went to Bali for goodness sake. Like, well, how, how ridiculous is that <laughs> mid-season? Like, I don't understand that. Players get enough time off. Sam Mitchell was saying on Footy Classified that his players finished on August twenty, mm-hmm. and they went back on December seven. Last. That's enough time off, and then you get your two yep. weeks over Christmas. That's fair. Then you get two four day breaks throughout the season. You don't need another one through the bite. I would just keep them training. That's yep. what I would do. Well, that's this, my, and this that's is my the best thing. guess. You mentioned you mentioned Sam. We spoke to him pregame um, last weekend, and we brought it up with him. And he goes, "Look, we've we've mentioned it to the players because mm. it's it's a real thing. The teams aren't coming back, you know, in the right probably more mental space than anything." for coming off the bye. And, there, and this doesn't count the teams that both had a bye because, yeah. you know, obviously that's just the, the reality. Someone there's only, there's only, yeah, someone has to win. There's a couple of games that have that have been in that uh, that case. Andrew McGrath spoke to you last night and he was sort of saying the same things around coming off the bye and, and not performing at the level required. That's why this week is, is so interesting because you've got Carlton versus Hawthorne. So all of a sudden it probably becomes mm. a bit of a 50-50 game. No, Sicily probably still leans in Carlton's favour to win this game, but... You know, it just makes it a bit more a bit more interesting with the Blues coming off the bye. North Melbourne's had the bye. They'll play the Adelaide Crows. You'd think Adelaide, of course, would would win that. Port Adelaide coming off the bye. Play Essendon at the MCG. So Essendon response off a loss and then take on the, uh, the power. Now, you'd expect the power to get this one done. But once again, it just tightens up a little bit with what we've seen so far. Richmond v Brisbane at the at the Gabba. Brisbane to, to win that one. Bulldogs versus Fremantle is... Is massive now. Bulldogs off the bye. Fremantle, uh, with the the form they're in at the moment, come to Marvel Stadium to take on the Dogs, who beat them by yep. in round six by fifty points. And then the Giants take on Melbourne in Alice Springs. Now Melbourne, once again, you go okay. Well, respond, get a win. Um, and the Giants, well, they've been in pretty good form before the bye. So all of a sudden, there's some sides in here, and there's some big games that we're starting to get really tight in the bottom part of the eight. And a couple of these games can shape that. And how these sides bounce off the bye is. Is really important. Maybe maybe we'll get three wins off the bye this weekend. I think Carlton mm. can still win. Port Adelaide can win. And I think the Bulldogs can beat Frio at Marvel. But it's just an interesting watch and interesting dynamic the way clubs are setting, their, setting themselves yeah, up. Because we have buys before big finals, don't we? And it doesn't seem to affect performance. In fact, it probably enhances performance. Well, every, yeah, everyone's... Oh, no, they're not necessarily... At the the no. first week of the finals, everyone's the same. But you're yes. right. You, you have off, yeah, it's a good point. You play so off, a, off a prelim... Is, yeah, but you keep yeah. training. Then you don't have time that's, off. That's what that's I was going to say, Jono. That's, yes. the, that's the point. The suspicion is you're not, you're not saying, okay, boys, go to Bali for four <laughs> days before we play the prelim final. You're not doing that. <laughs> you true. stay and you train at the footy club and you keep your normal program. And you still, so. you, would, you still would have some time off. Like you said, you'd get a day, you'd get a another half day here and a, and a full yeah. weekend potentially off, where you've got the Saturday, uh, Saturday after you train Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon off, full Sunday off, back to club Monday and and off you mm. off you go. Yeah, it's a it's, that's a really. Really good point. Maybe it's something that might be taken up in the years to come, but who knows? Well, the buy is probably going to be one full round next year, and we'll uh, we'll this won't even matter.